This morning, we continue our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 17 through 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 17 through uh, 24. If you need a Bible this morning, there's several Bibles provided there for you in the seat backs in front of you. And if you need to use one of those Bibles, you'll find this morning's passage on page 955 page 955. By way of reminder, 1 Corinthians 7 is Paul's extended discussion about both marriage and singleness, all right? The whole chapter is about that. But right in the middle of the chapter, in our passage today, it's like Paul inserts A word about contentment. Contentment in whatever situation God puts you in, in life. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17, Paul says this. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Uh, Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, There, let him remain with God. Bloom where you're planted. That's good advice. Especially when you're feeling frustrated, maybe, by life's circumstances. Uh, Perhaps you feel a bit stuck in your life and uh, you wish things could be different. You need to be reminded to be present and productive, making the most of every opportunity that's right there in front of you. Bloom where you're planted. I watched this principle play out literally in my front yard in recent days. I had to remove this great big mesquite tree that had toppled over in the wind. And in its place, I plant this small, lovely desert willow tree about I don't know, four feet high or so. I plant this tree, but then to my dismay, after soaking it in water for several days in a row, I watch as each of those little green leaves on that precious tree begin slowly to turn yellow. And one by one, all the leaves fall off. And I'm thinking, I killed it. I killed my tree. Maybe I'm overwatering it. Maybe I'm underwatering it. I'm Google searching, trying to figure out what's gone wrong. I'm in the depths of despair. And then my wife, Abby, reassures me, honey, it's okay. The tree's still alive. Just wait for spring. And then sure enough, spring comes, and my little tree begins to show those little green buds. And those little green buds turn into these big, beautiful flowers. My tree bloomed right where I planted it. Praise the Lord. Sometimes many of us act like that desert willow tree. We feel frustrated with life, discontent. We long for something more. Our leaves are turning yellow and falling off one by one. And what we need to do is bloom right where we're planted. We need to make the most of every opportunity that we have in the here and now. Again, that all sounds like good advice, doesn't it? But is it biblical? Bloom where you're planted sounds like something you'd hear from a life coach guru like Tony Robbins at one of his self-improvement seminars. Good advice, but is it in the Bible? 
you might be wondering. Friends, here's the thing. Not only is this idea in the Bible, but it's right here in our passage this morning. Paul has been talking, as you know, about singleness and marriage. And many people, isn't this true? Many people struggle with contentment when it comes to singleness or when it comes to marriage. And Paul wants the Corinthians to see that either station in life is a place where God can work in you and through you. And so three times in this passage, Paul urges the Corinthians to make the most of their God-given place in life. So look there in verse 17, he puts it there. Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And then he says it again in verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And then again, verse 24, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. In other words, friends, be fruitful and faithful wherever God places you. Be fruitful and faithful wherever God places you. Bloom where you're planted. And there is a lesson there for the Corinthians. It's also a powerful lesson for us this morning, isn't it? The passage lays out in three parts. I want you to see Paul gives us the principle and then two examples of it. So let's take a look. First of all, the principle. Be fruitful and faithful wherever God places you. We see that in verse 17. Only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. We need to remember that the Corinthian church was really a mix of people, wasn't it? Single folks and marrieds, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free. When the Corinthians came to Christ, it raised all kinds of questions for all these categories of people. They might be asking, does my newfound faith in Jesus require that I change my ethnic identity or I change my marital status or I change my job affiliation or change my place in society? And Paul says, no, 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 no. You should stay in the place the Lord assigned you when he called you to salvation. Notice that word assigned there in verse 17, assigned. It means to deal out or a lot or a portion. So when I'm serving up ice cream to my kids, I try to be fair when I assign or a portion, a bowl of several scoops to each one. That's their allotment, right? Well, Paul says the Corinthians were providentially assigned or allotted a place in life when they were called to salvation. So he says, were you single when you were saved? Look, you can stay single and glorify God. Were you married? You should stay married and fully please God in your marriage. Were you a Jew or a Gentile when you were saved? Be a uniquely Christian Jew or Christian Gentile now. Were you working as a bond servant? Were you a freedman when you were saved? Well, you can continue to serve the Lord in either capacity. You don't have to change your social or relational or vocational identity to be more pleasing to God. No, you can please him right where he's placed you when you were first saved. That's the idea. Now, as we'll see, this doesn't mean that Christians should never try to change their scenario. I don't think here Paul is ruling out change for Christian believers like us. It's just not as if he's saying you should never try to get a better job or never seek to move to another city or change from singleness to marriage and family or, or work to better your lives in some way. In fact, farther down in the passage, we will see that Paul encourages some change. He says to the slaves, if you have the opportunity to be free, go ahead and do it. And I think we could preach a whole nother sermon on change. We could preach a sermon about those Abraham moments in our life where God calls us to move away from our homeland and go do something entirely different similar to what we see in the Mitchell's life right now. But that's another sermon for another day. Here's what's happening here. What Paul is saying here is that each of us should analyze our lives right now and ask the question, where has God providentially placed me right now? 
In what situation has God providentially placed me? In what community do I live in, for instance? Where do I work? What colleagues and friendships and family members am I connected to? What season of life am I in? And am I making the most of every opportunity that's right here in front of me? Am I being fruitful and faithful? Not somewhere else, but right here, right now, in my actual life that the Lord has assigned to me. I think if we're honest, many of us struggle with the grass is greener syndrome, where you always think, The grass is greener on the other side of the fence, right? And we daydream constantly that if only this thing or that thing in my life could change, then life would really begin. Then I could really live for God. So some of you think, look, if only I could meet Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful and get married to them, then my real life would begin. Or we think, if only I could get into my preferred college, If only I could land that first job. If only I could get the promotion in my job. If only I could make partner. If only I could reach retirement. Well, then and only then I could finally be used of God to my maximum potential. Then real life would begin, we think. Here's the problem with that line of thinking. Life becomes like this ladder that you're constantly climbing. And every time you reach another rung, there's just more ladder to climb and you never arrive, do you? Meanwhile, you miss out on the opportunities that God puts right in front of your nose. Paul says, stop and think. Where has God providentially placed you right now? It may be that change is on the horizon, but for now, he says, be fruitful and faithful and glorify God right where you are. That's the principle. Next, let's look at a cultural example of this principle, a cultural example, Jew and Gentile. Look there at verse 18. Paul says, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. You know, from its very beginnings, Christianity had to work through ethnic tensions. Remember, Christianity started out as a Jewish religion, And yet countless Gentiles were coming to faith, weren't they? And so now you had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and they were worshiping side by side in the same church. And it begs some important questions. Did Gentile Christians have to become more Jewish in order to be faithful Christians now? On the other hand, Did Jewish believers need to shed away their cultural identity in order to be faithful Christians now? In our passage, Paul says, you actually should keep your cultural identity when you become a Christian. And so verse 18, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? So in other words, was anyone at the time of their call to salvation Were they already a circumcised Jew? He says, let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. He shouldn't go through some kind of surgery to make them appear less Jewish. On the other hand, he says, was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? In other words, when you were saved, were you an uncircumcised Gentile? Let him not seek circumcision. Let him not seek to become like a Jew, right? And then Paul's bottom line. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commands of God. So he says your cultural and ethnic identity is not more or less pleasing to God. No, what pleases God, Paul says, is your life of faithful obedience to God's word, no matter what culture you're in. Commentator David Garland puts it well. He says this, quote, Having accepted God's call, Christians must accept that 
God accepts them as they are. Their conversion requires a change in lordship, spiritual values, moral behavior, but not a change in race, gender, and social caste. Friends, this is so unique to Christianity. Do you realize that? Uniquely to Christianity, becoming a Christian does not force you to change your cultural or your ethnic heritage. Rather, Christianity incorporates your cultural heritage into it, and Jesus brings out the best of your cultural heritage. Uh, let me illustrate this, if I could. Um, with a Tacuna Bible, you guys recognize this? The entire Bible translated into the language of the Tacuna people uh, by Doris and, An uh, Doris and Lambert Anderson through their life's work. I want you to think with me for a moment. All those years ago when uh, Lambert and Doris decided to go to Peru to the Amazon to try to reach the Tacuna people with the gospel. Listen, their goal was not to go there and make the Tacuna people into Westerners. No, their goal was to go there and make them into Christians who, who now uniquely express their Christianity as Tacuna. So they're gonna to continue to dress like the Tacuna and eat food like the Tacuna and have architecture like the Tacunas have. And importantly, they're going to speak the language of the Tacuna people. And this is exactly why Doris and Lambert didn't make it their goal to teach the people English so that then they could read the English Bible. No, their life work was to translate the Bible into the Tacuna language so that the people could then read God's word in their own heart language. It's a great example of how the gospel works, how it advances among cultures. See, Jesus takes your culture and makes it his own. Were you Hispanic or Asian, African-American, Caucasian when you came to Christ? Were you Jew or Gentile? Paul says, don't think that you have to become someone else now that you're a Christian. No, you can distinctively express your cultural and ethnic heritage as a follower of Christ. One of the most beautiful things about the local church is that it's a melting pot of these distinctive cultures all coming together under the unified lordship of the Lord Jesus. It's a beautiful patchwork quilt. And have you noticed sometimes the most effective evangelists are those who reach people inside their own culture? As I was thinking about all of this, uh, a brother kept coming to mind, a dear friend of mine, brother, member of this church, who passed away unexpectedly rather recently. Um, this brother and his wife are both from India. Uh, they've lived here in the States for many years. They've raised their family here. He was a respected medical doctor in the Tucson medical community. And I got to thinking about how this brother was effective in impacting people for Christ, not just in one culture, but in at least two cultures. On the one hand, he was very effective in impacting those in Indian culture here in our area. But on the other hand, he made such an impact among people in the medical culture here at, in Tucson, uh, other medical professionals around him as well as patients. At least judging by the memorial service, where literally hundreds of people poured in and they had all these stories about how this man had impacted them this way or cared for them in that way. And it just got me thinking how he was faithful and fruitful, not just in one culture, but in at least two overlapping ones. Now, brothers and sisters, as you look at your life, what cultural, ethnic, and relational heritage has God blessed you with? How might God use you to uniquely impact certain kinds of people because of your unique background? Maybe you can impact people that others can't because of how God has positioned you. Well, Paul here says, be fruitful and faithful right where God places you. Bloom where you're planted. That's a cultural example, Jew and Gentile. But notice next, a vocational example, slave and free. We pick it up there in verse 20. Paul says, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. 
For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each one was called, there let him remain. Now, as modern people, as we read this text, and we're looking back on the evils and horrors of the transatlantic slave trade, we might read this and think, this is kind of weird. It's weird that Paul seems almost indifferent about slavery in this context, encouraging slaves to remain as they are. Uh, If you're thinking that, I think you'll be helped by considering a few things. Uh, First of all, we need to remember that slavery in the Greco-Roman world was a lot different than we often imagine. To be sure, it was human ownership and slaves had uh, no rights, no legal rights, uh, as it were. Uh, There were many, many horrible abuses. On the other hand, slavery was not race-based, okay? It wasn't race-based. People were born slaves or they were taken as a slave through war. Uh, But also, did you know, sometimes people would sell themselves into slavery in order to pay off debt or even to make a better life for themselves. Uh, In some ways, first century slavery was a whole lot, a lot more like indentured servitude. And this is why the ESV translates the word slave as the word bond servant, all right? They're trying to capture this sort of unique aspect of first century slavery. Uh, We need to know that slaves worked at every level of society. Uh, New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner writes this. He says, quote, many slaves lived miserably, particularly those that served in the mines. Other slaves served as doctors, teachers, managers, musicians, artisans, barbers, cooks, and shopkeepers, and could even own other slaves. In some instances, slaves were better educated than their masters. Most slaves were actually working toward their manumission, uh, which was usually offered to most slaves uh, up until and by the time of age 30. Um, Scholars estimate that about a third of the people in Corinth were slaves. Another third were recently freed or emancipated slaves. And another third were freeborn citizens. So adding all that up, slavery is certainly a lot different than we often picture in our mind's eye. On the other hand, on the other hand, Paul's argument in our text undermines slavery a lot more than we might think. His argument is this. You can keep serving the Lord as a slave, or if you have the opportunity, you can get free. But friend, either way, it ultimately doesn't really matter because in Christ, you are truly free. You serve a better, more ultimate master now. You answer to him alone. No one else actually owns you but him. Let's look at the argument in detail. Uh, Zoom in on verse 21. Paul says, were you a bondservant when called? So, So were you working as a slave when you were first called to faith in Christ? He says, do not be concerned about it. Don't fret, don't worry, don't stress out. Glorify God, serve Christ in your work. But Paul says... If you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. So if your master gives you the opportunity, take it. Serve Christ as a freeman. Either way, slave or free, you can work as a fruitful and faithful Christian. Why? Because Jesus is your true master now. Verse 22, look there. He who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man of the Lord. So you may look like a slave in the eyes of the world, but Jesus has set you free from sin. Likewise, Paul says, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. So to the world, you might look like a free man, but in fact... You're a slave of Christ. You serve him now. So here's the logic, all right? 
When Jesus is your true master, every other so-called master loses its power over you. In fact, when Jesus is your true master, as a Christian, you can work happily, contentedly, fruitfully, faithfully, wherever God places you, slave or free, because you serve Christ. And by the way, Paul says, if you happen to be free in society, now that you're a Christian serving Christ, Paul says, you don't have to sell yourself into slavery anymore. Verse 23, did you notice this incredible verse? You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Paul says, a lot of people out in our society may be selling themselves into slavery to pay off debts and so forth. But now that you belong to Christ, you shouldn't sell yourself into slavery anymore. You were purchased with the blood of Christ. So don't sell yourself to men anymore. That's a pretty socially subversive comment. I'll let you talk about it over lunch. Okay, so how then do we apply this to our lives today? I think it helps to imagine a scenario, a situation. Uh, Picture a young man living in Corinth in the first century world. A young man, say, 20 years old, and he works as a slave. He comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a Christian now. And now he lays there at night, and he's looking at the ceiling, tossing and turning and fretting and thinking, and he thinks, if only I could get out of here and get free. Ten more years of serving my master. I mean, he told me I had a chance to buy my freedom at age 30, but that's 10 years away. Meanwhile, I'm stuck. He thinks I need to get free so God can really use me to do something meaningful and important with my life. Not just running my master's errands and tutoring his kids and keeping his books and cleaning his latrines. No, listen, I need freedom. And once I get out of here, I'm going to finally go into full-time ministry. Then I can really serve God. Can you picture the scenario in your mind's eye? What would the apostle Paul say to that young 20-year-old slave? Here's what Paul would say. He would say, young man, listen, now that you know Christ, listen, you don't have to wait 10 more years to begin serving him fully. You don't have to wait 10 more years uh, until you're finally free to to serve God and please him and glorify him. No, you can serve Christ right now. Be fruitful and faithful, young man, right now. Bloom where you're planted in your line of work that God has placed you in. Here's how Paul puts this in another place. Colossians chapter 3, 22 through 24. He says, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Friends, do you see how how powerful this really is? Paul is telling slaves that their earthly master is not their true master. Their true master is Jesus Christ. Think about it. This puts work in its proper place. Your work no longer owns you. No, Jesus does. This teaching also dignifies work, doesn't it? Look, as a Christian, no matter how trivial you think your daily work may be, it actually has tremendous value because you serve the king of kings. Furthermore, you don't have to constantly daydream about some better job or better role where you can finally serve God and be fulfilled and life will finally all come together. No, you can serve King Jesus right now. Turns out this is really relevant for us today, isn't it? Many of us constantly wonder if if we could finally serve Jesus once we get out of this nine to five minimum wage grind. Or maybe you think if I could just make a little bit more or if I could just get out on my own and be my own boss or if I could just finally sell this company or if I could just finally retire. 
Then, and only then, I'll finally have time for ministry. God can finally use me. Look, perhaps those things will work out. Perhaps you will take those steps and change will happen. But here God's word tells us, in the meantime, Jesus is saying, what about your current work? What about wh wh where you are right now? What about your influences on your, uh, on your current uh, colleagues or the way you influence your fellow employee, uh, other employees or fellow students or patients or clients? What about your witness to your current boss? or your ability to glorify God in the line of work that you currently do, no matter what it is. Ultimately, friends, you serve Jesus now, so please him wherever he's placed you. Many of us are tempted to find our ultimate identity in our work, aren't we? It's really natural to do. I mean, when you meet someone new, what's the first thing they ask you? So what do you do uh, for work? <laughs> and so it's so easy to base your worth on your work. That's probably why we fret so much about finding the perfect job in the perfect place where I, all of my skills can be perfectly used and I can be perfectly fulfilled. But Paul reminds us here that our true identity is in Jesus, no matter what we do. Pastor Tony Merida put it this way. He said, quote, our fundamental identity is not in what we do, but in whose we are. And this is what's amazing. When you realize whose you are, you could do anything that God calls you to do for his glory. You can be fruitful and faithful wherever he places you. So church family, bloom where you're planted. That's good advice indeed. And yes, even self-help gurus can affirm this phrase. But sadly, for the unbelieving world, this statement really is just positive self-talk. It's just framing things positively, making lemonade out of lemons or finding the silver lining. For unbelievers, there's real, really no substance to this phrase. Uh, no, no matter how positive you are, without God, life is still meaningless and random and empty in the end. But listen, for Christians, for those who put their faith in Christ, bloom where you're planted is uniquely meaningful. Why? Here's why. Because we actually know the one who's planted us. <laughs> we know the gardener. And that means that our lives are not random. They are not arbitrary. No, our lives are are providentially led by the very God who made us and he's placed us someplace on purpose. So Christ community, take a moment. Think about where you live, what you do, and who you know. Where has God planted you? Are you constantly daydreaming about someplace else or are you living present and productive, faithful and fruitful, taking full advantage of every opportunity from God. Or to quote the Apostle Paul in verse 24, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with 